When I was 19 years old, I went to Mexico to travel. I met Daniel. It was something I'd always dreamed of, but it was kind of beyond a dream. It was actually going to happen. I was going to marry the perfect man. I knew something wasn't quite right. He sounded a bit dodgy. You never love me. You love my mother. As soon as Sebastian was born, I realized that Daniel wasn't the man I thought he was. I no longer was his princess. I just became the bitch. When Samantha Lowry went to Mexico, she thought she'd met the man of her dreams. But then he vanished with their baby. Nobody's going to take a baby away from his mother. Daniel had stated that he would kill Sebastian. I kept telling myself, nobody, nobody would do it. They'll bring him back any second. In 2002, 19-year-old Samantha Lowry left her home in the Wiltshire countryside to go traveling in Mexico. And one evening, I went to a bar, and um, Daniel sat across the bar from me, and we were just looking at each other all night. And, well, we just clicked straight away, really. Sam had been on a holiday in Mexico, or she'd been there for six months. And she had met some guy in a bar, and she seemed to be very interested in him. He made me feel very special. He used to, well, treat me like a princess. It sounded like a fairy tale. I mean, she'd met this man that she was in love with, and he was wealthy. And We spent about three months together in Puerto Vallarta. And then I left to go back to England to go to university. And during the next three years, we stayed in close contact by email. I knew that I had strong feelings for Daniel, and he said he was still in love with me. So in August 2005, I booked a two-week holiday to go and visit Daniel in Playa del Carmen. Having graduated with a degree in mathematics, Sam returned to Mexico to rekindle her relationship with Daniel Pavón Cuellar. When I arrived, we clicked again straight away. He owned a hotel and booked a room for me to stay in. Daniel was an artist, and he came from an incredibly wealthy family from Mexico City. He looked quite mysterious, but great fun to be with. I felt completely secure with Daniel. I loved everything about him. I loved everything he did. I loved the way he treated me. He would open the door for me all the time. He'd always come and pull my chair out in every restaurant. And that made me admire him and love him more. And we would go and visit remote beaches as where it was just white sand for miles and miles. Life couldn't have gotten any better at that time. She was living in a hotel by the beach. It was every girl's dream and she just seemed really besotted with him. By this point, he was already asking me to stay, um, but I thought I'd wait at least a week and see how I felt. And by the end of the two weeks, I was quite deeply in love with him. So I called my family in England to tell them I wasn't coming home. The next thing we heard, she didn't even want to move back to England. She just wanted to stay there with him. My family were quite shocked, but they were also excited for me because they could see how excited I was and what an amazing thing it was. So they were also happy for me. Daniel gave the impression that he was a bit of a playboy. And that gave me the impression that maybe something wasn't quite right there. After six months in Mexico, the couple decided to move to Austin, Texas.
Daniel's family owned a house there. We thought it would be easier. I could speak English. He was an artist, and he wanted to start selling his paintings, which would have been a lot easier doing in America than in Mexico. And we thought we could base ourselves there, and then we could still go back to Mexico and England when and as we pleased. Daniel. Daniel planned a surprise for Sam to celebrate moving into their new home. And as he opened the door, there were all these presents laid out, which was well, very unexpected, but very nice. And I just started opening each one. And this one is for you. And it, it was incredible to have that many presents. It was like being a spoiled child. And then at the end, he got down on one knee and asked me to marry him. Will you marry me? <laughs> and I said yes, and then I started crying, and I think he had a few tears, and we were just hugging and incredibly happy. My parents really liked him, really approved, and were just really pleased with how happy he was making Sam. And then on the other hand, there was Joe, who especially didn't like him. My instincts from the beginning were that he sounded a bit dodgy, and I jumped to the conclusion that he's some kind of criminal. In August, I found out I was pregnant. When I told Daniel I was pregnant, he was incredibly happy and excited about it too. But as I became more tired and less able to do things and you know, my stomach got bigger, I started noticing that Daniel's behavior was changing. He stopped being so nice to me, the gifts stopped coming, and we were getting on less and less, and he was becoming a very different man to the man I thought he was. And Sebastian was born on the 29th of March. It was an incredible feeling just to, well, the first time I hugged him and knew that he was actually mine and just such a tiny little thing. It was amazing and I just loved him so much. There was nothing I wouldn't have done for him. I wanted to be with him every single second. As soon as Sebastian was born, I realised that Daniel really wasn't the man I thought he was. He took no interest whatsoever in Sebastian. And when I was with Sebastian, he took no interest any longer in me because I wasn't, I wasn't paying all the attention to Daniel anymore. I had Sebastian now, and he was the one who needed looking after. Daniel refused to help. He refused to change him, to feed him, to do anything. He would say a man's duty is to go out and work and bring in the money, and a woman's is to look after the baby in the house. Before Sebastian was born, he said he'd never held a baby in his life. And he just had no clue about babies. He didn't know that they needed constant looking after, and he wasn't willing to give it. When things did start to go a bit sour between us because I wanted him to be more involved and he wasn't interested. I no longer was his princess as he used to call me. I just became the bitch. So, come on. Sam. Adding to Samantha's trouble, Sebastian had an intolerance to baby formula milk, creating more of a rift between her and Daniel. 
Baby, I'm doing my work right now. Do something, you baby. I was breastfeeding Sebastian every one and a half hours, and he wouldn't rock him in the night if he cried. So I was incredibly tired, and I was struggling. But he didn't want anything to do with it. Daniel! Daniel. On one occasion, we were sitting together eating, and we were talking quite civilly, which we hadn't done for quite a while. Suddenly, he started listing what I'd done wrong in the relationship and things. He was saying what a bitch I was, how pathetic, how I'd just always used him, never loved him. And that's the time when I called off the wedding. I didn't want that type of man bringing up my son. Let's build our family up. I told him that I didn't, I no longer wanted to marry him. He picked up the plates and smashed them. And all I said was, Daniel, I'm not listening to this. It was really scary. It's the sort of thing you see on a film. Just wasn't normal. He he just looked absolutely crazy. And he was getting crazier by the second. And I thought if he's done this big a change within weeks, you don't know how far he's willing to go. It went on for about three hours, him behaving like this. I was very, very scared. And I was incredibly scared for Sebastian. Sam decided that she wanted to take Sebastian back to Britain. But there was a problem. Under international law, she needed Daniel's permission. What's more, her visitor's visa had expired, making her an illegal alien. I went from completely trusting him and knowing he'd do the best for me to realizing that he had complete power over me now and he was in control of everything. If I didn't do as he pleased, then I would lose Sebastian. Sam managed to persuade Daniel to let her stay at a friend's house for the night, promising to return with Sebastian the next morning. By morning, I knew that I was not going to go back to the house, that it was too dangerous, especially with Sebastian. And Daniel had emailed and phoned quite a few times that day, telling me that I must go back, that I had no right to leave the house with Sebastian, and that I promised I'll be back um, that morning. And I said that I wasn't going to come back because of his behavior. But after four days of constant emails and phone calls, Sam finally agreed to meet with Daniel to discuss their situation. As agreed, Sam returned with baby Sebastian to meet with Daniel. At four o'clock, I took Sebastian round to Daniel's. How's the baby? I then thought I could have a nap while Daniel was gonna be with Sebastian for a while. So I went and lay down. Sam. But a few minutes later. Come on, go away. Who are you talking Just about? go, just go, come on. Daniel told me to get out of his house. So it's my time with service right now. Why don't you leave? Come on, just go. Come on. Are you kidding me? No, I'm serious. Come on. So I didn't want an argument. I didn't I'd had enough of the arguing. I went and stood outside the door. A few minutes later, I thought, this is ridiculous. I can't bring Sebastian around and stand outside the door. So I went back in. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Huh? Okay, come on, come on. And I said, I don't think this is right. I should be inside the house with Sebastian. He told me to get out again. This is my home. It is my time, four hours. And shouted that I'd never see Sebastian again, and he slammed the door. I was banging on the door trying to get in, and he wouldn't let me in. Come on! Come on! 
By this point, I was crying and really scared of what was actually going to happen. And then I saw Daniel running out of the house with Sebastian. He literally threw him into the car. He was eight weeks old. He wasn't in a proper car seat. And Daniel got into the car and raced off at an incredible speed. At this point, I, I kept thinking he'd taken him around the block I, because it was so unbelievable that somebody would actually do this. I think deep down I knew he probably had taken him further, but I just kept, kept telling myself nobody, nobody would do it. He's not going to do it. He'll bring him back any second. Nobody's going to take a baby away from his mother. Um, but he didn't come back. For the first time in my life, you're in a situation where there's really nothing that you can do. I received a phone call just saying, I need to come home now. I was just told that Daniel had taken Sebastian. I woke up to a message from my brother saying, Daniel's taken the baby. I decided I was going to call the police because I had already decided I was going to go for custody regardless of my visa. And when the police arrived, we went into Daniel's house and then we started rummaging through things. And we found some very strange notes and a map of Mexico. So we guessed he was going to Mexico with him. With nowhere to live, Sam moved back into Daniel's house. And with the help of the Austin City Police, who overlooked her expired visa, she began to search for her baby. There was another reason for the urgency, Sebastian's intolerance to formula milk. My greatest fear then was that um, Sebastian was intolerant to formula and I wasn't there to feed him, so I didn't know what would happen to him. Within 24 to 48 hours, he could die of dehydration. If he survived one day, he may not survive the next. Hoping that Daniel would make contact, the police hastily set up recording equipment to monitor phone calls. While the police were still there, the phone rang and it was Daniel. He told me that I needed to go down to Mexico that day. He gave me a list of things to pack, what to do with the house, and then I would go and join him. He told me that if I told the police or my family or anyone else what he had done, then I would never see Sebastian again. I was crying and begging. I didn't know what to do. And I was just saying, please, please, like, you know, don't do this to me. Don't threaten that I'll never see my son again. Um, luckily, the police detective was listening in on this phone call, so we got all these threats recorded. I was really desperate now because I realized he actually meant that if I did not do what he said, then I wouldn't see my son again. Daniel wanted me to go to Mexico where he could have complete control over me. And I told everyone I was going, and I was 100% set on going. But the police said, it's, it's just not safe for you to go. And eventually, I was persuaded. With Sebastian in any one of Daniel's several houses across Mexico, the US authorities issued an international warrant for Daniel to return him to America. But the problem was that Sebastian was under the jurisdiction of Mexico. Um, and the US authorities, all the British authorities, are not allowed to work in Mexico without their permission. In a bid to help her secure Sebastian's return, Sam's family joined her in Austin. Daniel's house became the Lowry's command center. It's not in my family just to sit by and let something bad happen to us. We set the entire house up around trying to find Sebastian. We brought new computers in. We 
set up new internet connections. And we started trying to log any information we got on Sebastian's whereabouts or Daniel's intentions. We didn't stop morning till night. One person would be checking the emails, another would be plotting on a map his latest movements. Somebody else answering phone calls. And it just, it didn't seem to stop. We didn't eat. We were sleeping in two hour shifts. Sometimes it just, it just seemed like there was too much to do. There seemed to be people running everywhere. It was, it was manic. As Sam's family investigated Daniel's background, they discovered he had a history of abusive relationships. He had a current arrest warrant for unpaid child support from a lady who he had a child with years ago. And we found a previous arrest warrant on Daniel for stalking his ex-wife and harassment and threatening bodily harm with a knife. <laughs> I mean, he had done this his whole life. He had abused a lot of people. It made us fear a lot more for what he could do to Sebastian. <laughs> Throughout the whole time, Daniel was contacting us by email. They were generally completely disgusting emails, calling me a prostitute and a whore, telling me I slept with the police and the FBI and even George Bush, and that's why I had the law on my side in this case. The team found a way of using these emails to track Daniel to locations back in Mexico. It wasn't precise, but without any clear information on his whereabouts, it was the best they had. And we saw that every two to three days he was generally moving. Mm, okay. Yeah, okay. Even though at this time I you know, was in complete despair and didn't know if I would ever make it, and at times I really didn't think I could go on or want to keep living. Something inside me did keep me going on. And I did know deep down that, you know, even if it took me the rest of my life, I would keep searching for Sebastian. That was what I was going to do forever. While Sam attempted to track Daniel and baby Sebastian from her base in Texas, her brother Joe went straight to Mexico City. We recruited a close friend of mine, Tristan. He was going to go with me to Mexico. We realised we were in potentially very dangerous waters. Our aim was to try and find out any information we could, try and find where Daniel was, and try and be undetectable so nobody would know where we were, so there could be no chance of us getting caught. brought cameras of various descriptions, GPS trackers, spy equipment, equipment that we might need to do our own investigation. Joe and Tristan were completely unqualified for the task at hand, but they decided to stake out Daniel's houses regardless. The main house that uh, Daniel's parents had was in a very, very nice area indeed. There was high barbed wire fences all around all of the properties. They had security guards every four or 500 meters which meant that we couldn't break into the property because someone would find out before we got anywhere and then we'd be carted away by the Mexican police. So the plan was to put up some wanted posters for Daniel, uh, which had a picture of Daniel on and said Sebastian being abducted. We put these up around the areas that his parents lived in. The purpose of this was to show the family that this was very serious. They could not just brush this under the carpet. When we were putting the posters up outside the parents' property, we actually spotted Daniel.
Daniel's retaliation for Joe and Tristan's efforts in Mexico City was terrifying. Daniel started a six-day countdown that Sebastian will die. He wouldn't say why he'd die, he just would say he would die. <laughs> At this point, we were quite desperate and we didn't really know what to do to stop it. We were on the phone to every authority again and just hounding them, you know, you've got to do something. Sebastian's going to die. As each day passed, we were getting more frantic because in our mind, there was a, a realistic chance that he was gonna kill Sebastian at the end of six days. Initially, we felt like, well, we had six days and that, that would make people act, but things were carrying on the same as before. Each day I was living in torture. It was just a feeling of complete and utter helplessness. And, and it was scary because, you know, a madman had the power. Mom. On day six, nothing happened. Daniel just changed his tune to one of his abusive emails and carried on as if it had never happened. The hate I felt towards Daniel was insane, and it was really scary because I've never felt hate before, let alone that strong. I mean, I just, I hated him so much. I was so angry at him. <coughs> I went crazy. I kept thinking, I can't do this for much longer. You know, a few more days and I won't make it. And at times I actually genuinely thought I, I couldn't make it. I, I didn't want to be living without Sebastian. I think she would have spent every single day wondering what her son was doing and where he was. It just would have ruined her whole life. I don't think, I don't think it's something any mother gets over losing a child and especially if they don't know where they are or what's happened to them. Six weeks after the kidnapping, Sam's family hired a female private investigator to help Joe locate Sebastian. We went around all of his houses one of the evening, and we made the foolish mistake of going back around the same houses on a second evening. We were trying to see if anything had, anything had changed so we could see if anyone was living there. Somehow, we were detected. I don't really know exactly what happened because it, it was all so quick. I think I was being dragged down the slope and one or two other people were kicking and punching me. One of them kicked me straight directly in the face. The, the PI lady, she was unconscious in a heap.
There was a lot of blood everywhere. My mouth was bleeding. My nose was bleeding. The next day we had a meeting with the FBI and they, they basically said this kind of thing does happen. And in their opinion, it was a, a strict warning. Don't go down this path. Do not track us. Finally, several weeks after the kidnapping, they got the news that they'd been waiting for. A Mexican judge had approved the warrant for Daniel's arrest. It meant that the Mexican police now had the power to raid Daniel's properties in the search for Sebastian. With the help of the British and American Embassy and the Mexican Child Welfare Division, a search warrant was issued by a Mexican judge. All of Daniel's houses were raided by the Mexican authorities. But the houses were completely empty and had been emptied for a while. So all the effort we put into trying to make them search Daniel's houses, it was all for nothing. To us, it was slightly suspicious because we knew Daniel had been in that house. And then very shortly before the authorities did actually raid the house, he seemed to have left. In mid-October, five months after Sebastian's kidnapping, Sam made a pivotal decision. It had got to the point that nothing, nothing was happening anymore and even we were running out of things to do. We had used, you know, the FBI. We had hired some of the best private investigators we could possibly find. Sam was planning to go to Mexico, and I was, I was just really hoping that she'd change her mind somehow. Everyone else was scared for me, but I wasn't, and I wrote my will in case anything did happen, and I went down there to help Sebastian. Nobody was keen for her to go to Mexico because we thought it was dangerous. However, I, I was of the opinion by the end that we didn't really have any options. We had done everything that we could think of to try and save Sebastian. And we, and we couldn't. We, we couldn't find him to help him. So I wrote to Daniel telling him that I would be in the Centre Historico, which is the centre square of Mexico. I said I'd be there from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at night. And I begged him to come or to send someone for me or to just give me some sort of word of how Sebastian was, if he was even alive. Me and Tris were quite concerned for her safety and we were aware that it was a badly thought out plan. And probably the, the full stupidity of it didn't really hit us. Sam was determined to do this anyway, so we didn't, we didn't have a choice. People have said, you can send people to come and take you away. They could, you know, keep you hostage. They could kill you. You know, you're the cause of Daniel's problems right now, and all he needs to do is get rid of you, which isn't hard, and then they're gone. Throughout the day, in one hotel, um, a curtain kept moving. There was somebody looking out. And I was trying not to look directly at the window because I didn't want them to see that, you know, that I knew. But nothing ever came of it. It didn't seem like it was them, or if it was them, then they had left. Despite sitting in the square all day, there was no sign of Daniel or baby Sebastian. Low on funds, the Lowrys were running out of options. Because our finances had now 
you know, pretty much completely run out. We had found a hotel that was the equivalent of one pound a night to stay in. Because we were trying to save money, we were only eating rice and bread and bananas, so we all got quite ill. But it, it just really didn't matter. We just kept fighting through it. I think we were possibly more depressed at this time because it seemed that life could not get any worse. Then, out of the blue, Daniel sent a photo. First, I couldn't even open the attachment. I didn't, I was too scared to see what he looked like. Then I did look at it. And it was a sickening feeling to see it. He was, it looked like a hostage situation. It was a baby with no clothes on, lay next to a newspaper in a bare room. It was the first hard evidence that Sebastian was alive and had survived his intolerance to formula milk. And then there was another crucial development. After Sebastian had been kidnapped for about five months, the wife of our lawyer said, do you think he might have narcissistic personality disorder? I'd previously never heard of this personality disorder, which stems from childhood. And it's really where a person, deep, deep down, they feel so inferior and, in and inadequate that they can't deal with it. So they make up a false self, as it's called, that they are the greatest person in the world. And they actually force themselves to believe it. We started to consult with psychologists, and that gave us the idea that maybe there was the possibility of manipulating him. The key was to take control by finding Daniel's point of weakness. With the help of a psychologist, Sam began a barrage of aggressive emails. The psychologist asked us um, anything about Daniel's insecurities and fears. We were going to stoop to his level. That, that's part of the manipulating a narcissist. You stoop to their level, you copy what they do. When he says, you know, you're a prostitute, you write back saying, well, you're a prostitute. I mean, it is that pathetic, but it's what you do. They became as disgusting as his, if not more. They were based on a lot of prison scenarios about gang rapes in prison, about incidents in the shower. And then they also paid a lot on Daniel's lack of achievements in life, that he was still a mummy and daddy's boy and living off their money, that he was a pathetic criminal on the run. But at the end of each one, it gave him a way out. If you return Sebastian for me, we will stop and we won't chase you to the ends of the earth. But if you don't, we will, and your life will end up in prison. And he didn't want to go to prison as much as I wanted Sebastian. I remember um, reading the email from Daniel begging us to stop. And it was quite a short email from him, it said in big, bold capital letters, I beg you to stop writing these emails. I realized that for the first time during all this time that I had a bit of control because our plan had actually began to work. Finally, Daniel relented. His lawyers contacted Sam and offered her a chance to discuss custody and see her baby. Six months after the kidnapping, Daniel's lawyers asked Sam to a meeting to discuss custody of their baby. When we went up to the meeting, we were, I was told that Daniel wasn't going to come, that one of the lawyers was going to go and get Sebastian because Daniel was scared he'd be arrested. They had a video camera in my face the entire time, which I was asking them not to, and they insisted. I was very angry the way the lawyers were being. I kept crying and just kind of very confused and more excited and scared. Daniel's lawyers wound us up the wrong way quite a lot. 
we found the lawyers to be quite arrogant, but there was also obviously the fear that Daniel would chicken out of giving Sebastian back or something else would go wrong. And it took about an hour to go through everything and sign it. And although it felt we were so close, we were still so scared that it wasn't going to happen. And we just sat there waiting, not knowing what was going to happen. Seems to take forever. It was so hard not knowing, you know, if this was the time I was really going to see my son or if it was going to be messed up again. At last, news came that Sebastian was there. I opened the door, knowing Sebi was inside. There was Sebastian, someone was holding him. And I just went over and kind of grabbed him and was hugging him. And it, it was incredible, it was an incredible relief, but it was also incredibly hard, because I, I didn't recognize him in the slightest. He didn't look anything like the baby who was taken. And then I was crying and shaking, and it was very emotional, and I think probably quite a few people had quite a few tears then. <laughs> Under her agreement, Sam was supposed to return Sebastian the next day. But with the assistance of the embassy officials, they had hatched a different plan. We played it pretty cool that day. We chatted them about what we we're going to do tomorrow and what time we were meeting and didn't rush off. We hung around, we talked to them. But we had no intention of keeping up with our end of the bargain. Leaving the lawyer's office was still quite scary, and we were, you know, looking around just trying to see if we had been followed. We went out of a back door that no one else knew about. We were still under threat. Daniel could have us followed. He could take Sebastian back. He could do anything. That was scary, and it wasn't probably over until I could take off in the plane. Take off and get out of Mexico. My entire family gave up their lives. They gave up their jobs, their university at Sam's, everything. And it broke us financially. Six months of this has taken away my parents' pension. It's put us all into a lot of debt. I'm really proud of my family and how everyone just dropped their lives to help. Daniel had no idea what, how strong I was going to become and how close and strong my family were. He didn't know that, you know, seven people would be flying out to help me and we would fight him and his family through the end. And I would have. I would have done anything to save Sebastian. <laughs>